Topic for our conversation today um, is distance social emotional learning. Um, we know that each of you has a really unique context. Um, we know that seven weeks ago, a lot of us started this journey, um, never having done anything like it before. Um, and what you're going to hear today is a lot of what we have tested, tried, problem solved um, at Momentus, um, and, and know that our context is unique. Um, and so the idea that you might hear something today that doesn't fit your context is probably going to happen. Um, and our hope is that you hear something that uh, sticks with you um, and that you can transfer to your own, um, your own environment, your students, your families, um, and, and you know, go from there. So let's jump into a little bit of who we are, a little bit more about Momentus. Many of you have experienced us before. Um, Ron is going to go ahead and explain what Momentus is all about. Sure, so Momentus Institute is a nonprofit agency. We're located in uh, the Dallas area in, in Texas, and um, we are rather old agency. We're about 100 years old. Uh, for the last 40 years, we've really been focusing on providing direct services at the intersection of mental health and education. So the graphic you have in front of you really outlines these three areas of direct service. Uh, the one in the red is Momentous School. It is our lab school, uh, and that's the school that Daniel is principal of. Um, we serve uh, kids between the ages of three and fifth grade. Um, and so we've learned a lot of lessons in the last seven weeks about how we do social emotional learning while kids are not physically with us. And we're gonna be sharing some of those lessons learned. Uh, we have uh, the other path for direct services, therapeutic services, and uh, we have all kinds of um, different therapeutic uh, practices that we offer to kids and their families. Um, and then we have our last lane of direct service, and that is uh, research and training. So uh, we're researching everything we do. We, we draw from the research. We try to contribute to the research. And um, we're sharing out what we know through all kinds of training. So I encourage you to look at our website. Uh, if you go to momentousinstitute.org um, backslash events, you'll find all kinds of trainings that we offer um, virtually online and face-to-face -face as well. So um, we do this because we really realize that kids need social emotional health in order to achieve in life, um, in school as well, but life in general. And so we've come up with a definition that we think is pretty easy to remember, pretty sticky. So this is our definition of social emotional health. And it's the ability to understand and manage your emotions, your reactions, and your relationships. So these skills right now during a situation like we're in uh, with the pandemic, all of these are so incredibly important, um, but we know that kids need these in order to succeed. So we, we park on this notion. Yeah, and adults too. I think this is a and adult. We're all we're all going through all the time. And it's much easier said than done. Some days are much better than others, so yeah. Absolutely, you're right. So when we were thinking about, um, you know, developing a webinar for uh, mostly educators, we were thinking about, you know, why social emotional learning right now? Um, if we kind of go back and think seven weeks ago when everything shut down so quickly, I'm sure that the first instinct of most educators um, was how do I get learning to uh, sustain? And how do I do this in a virtual world? And, who's gonna have connectivity and, and what does this look like? I mean, so many questions coming up just around how do we provide the academic support that we were supposed to be doing. Um, and so I can see why social emotional learning might, might have taken a back seat even for those schools that have a social emotional learning initiative. Um, and so thinking about why is social emotional learning important right now? We think it's important because there's all kinds of increased anxiety around uh, just the circumstances in which we live. And we know that when um, you have heightened anxiety, really your, your fight, flight, or freeze mode kicks in, and it really makes the brain uh, less um, flexible and, and you have less access to really good learning. So all of the wonderful things that you're doing uh, for your students digitally really need to be prefaced by a lowering of their anxiety. So that's where social emotional learning comes in. 
We know that you have to attend to Maslow's hierarchy of needs and the need for safety and belonging before you can really get into Bloom's taxonomy. So it's really social emotional learning um, is it, it comes before we, we dive into academics. So we know that kids at this time, they need a lot of reassurance. Um, they need to know that adults are in charge and that this will be over, this will end, and we will all be together again. Um, they need reassurance that they're still connected to each other, that they're still in school. So, um, so they not only need reassurance, they need consistency and they need connection. And so um, as we jump into um, like, what do we do with this level of anxiety and these different pieces, um, we have three big sort of takeaways we hope that you walk away with today. Um, the first is that we hope that you guys figure out some ways to provide connection. The second is about providing consistency for, 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 for children and for families. And the third is about looking for opportunities in challenges. And right now there's lots of challenges and there are lots of opportunities. Um, so let's go ahead and dive into that first one. Rhonda, you all okay? Yeah, I'm good, sorry. That's okay, yep. So the first one's about providing connection. Sure, so, um, you know, uh, schools are academic institutions, obviously, but they're also very deep social systems. And so we have to think about how do we, um, how do we use those social systems and why are they so important to, kids and adults and they're important because they provide this sense of social connection to each other so let's start by talking about how are we using this time to provide connections with families and with students daniel you want to give up some examples of how we're doing this at the school yeah gosh um it, it's an interesting thing that's come out of this we have never had better relationships with our families um the amount of connection the touch points learning has entered their living rooms and the the connection between school and home has become so strong um and that's something we're trying to figure out how to transfer into the future like what have we done that's helped make those relationships possible um and i think the first thing is just every conversation that our staff is having with our families starts on a human level it asks the questions how are you and then like how actually are you doing um we have found that a lot of our families I mean, their, their opportunities to talk to the teachers are some of the, you know, connections that they have with other adults. And they have enjoyed just talking about life and about the challenges that they're facing. Families have really opened up to our teachers. Um, and, and a lot of that's because of the relationships we had built prior to all of this happening. Mm -hmm. um, our families and students really know our staff. And we were able to really capitalize on that when everything happened so quickly. Um, and, and the other piece of it is about connecting with students. Teachers are finding so many ways to connect with students. Even for our youngest grade level, our pre-K three, our pre-K four students, our teachers are still calling them. They're still checking in with them. Um, our students have opportunities to engage in different digital platforms. Um, we're using Google Classroom, and that's a big resource we're using for our older grade levels. Um, and so, yeah, I'll kind of pause there um, and sort of those are some of the ways that we're connecting with our students um, and our families. Yeah, and I, I appreciate you saying, you know, this is such an opportunity to connect with parents and we'll, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But um, I'm thinking about as a former school teacher, how many parents you would maybe not see during the year, maybe once or twice or maybe in the car line but this is really equalizing so that we're connecting with parents on a regular basis and all parents not just the ones who you know volunteer for pta or um show up to volunteer at the school um and then the next piece of connection that i think is so important is we've got to maintain uh opportunities for students to connect with each other so um how are you doing that daniel um, so a big piece of momentous is, is the relationships that we're able to build peer to peer. Um, and two of the ways we do that is through our morning and closing circles. Um, and we've still had those at a distance. So every morning starts with a morning circle and every afternoon ends with a closing circle. Um, and those follow a similar style, right? There's a chance to connect. There's a chance to share. There's a chance to ask questions, set goals for the day. Um, and they've been really fun. They've been really a great way to bring some of that home life into those conversations. Scavenger hunts where you go and find something that's important to you and bring it back to the Zoom. Or if you have a pet, it's, you know, show and tell for dogs that day. Um, 
I've seen chickens, I've seen cats, I've seen fish, turtles. I mean, kids love sharing about their lives. Um, and we're finding that they miss each other a lot. Mm -hmm. Our children really care about each other um, and they miss each other a lot. Um, and so teachers responded to that and they actually offer like purely social opportunities for children to connect with each other. Grade levels have lunch together. Some grade levels have breakfast together. There's a recess Zoom where they're just open and teachers are monitoring, but kids can really just engage with each other how they would like. Um, so that's been really fun to just have kids be kids um, because we kind of forget that a little bit sometimes. So building those opportunities for that social time that Daniel's talking about, um, I know that you're focusing a lot on how do I get the academics out there, but also plan those times where kids can, as Daniel says, just be kids. Um, and then the last one is really connection for yourself. Um, you know, school is a, is a big social system for you as well. You spend most of your wakeful time working. And so we tend to get pretty close with the people that we work. Um, and so this is really a time uh, to, to reconnect with colleagues and also help, have them help, um, you know, share some of the, the burden, if you will, of, of this sort of new type of teaching, maybe the burden is too strong of a word, but, um, you know, let them share a little bit of the load and, and coming together with uh, thinking and sharing ideas is really, really helpful right now. So, Daniel, what's going on at Momentous School? Yeah. Um, at, we've really, the, that's another big piece it's, that, that, that people are missing right now is a chance to see each other. They see each other so often in the hallways or at lunch and things like that. Um, we've continued offering our professional learning program. So we still come together once a week for, for uh, professional learning. And we're making clear that the balance is, is there between connecting with each other. We'll often start with breakout rooms where people have a chance to just talk, share how they're feeling, check in with one another. Um, and we do something similar on Fridays. We have kind of a, a close out meeting, which is a lot lighter. It's a lot more just fun um, sort of culture building opportunities for staff. Um, we are really utilizing those breakout rooms in Zoom. Um, it's hard to have a genuine connection with 40 small screens. If you can send people off to a room with two or three people, they can really have a nice conversation. Um, and we're also encouraging people to do this work together like they would teaching. Um, yesterday, we actually did a peer observation protocol. Um, teachers have been filming themselves teaching. They actually watched each other's videos and offered feedback to one another. Um, and so that was a way to show, hey, I'm not really doing this alone. And we hope that moving forward, somebody might say, hey, can you check out this video? Because they've already done that experience. So those are ways for you to build connections for your colleagues. That's awesome. All of these are really important. We need to stay connected with one another. Um, yeah. Well, and, and the second thing too, I would say is listen to your staff, right? Gain, gauge their sense of like capacity. Um, and we've gotten some people that have said, this is too much, right? And so mm -hmm. we're looking at our schedule and saying, is this worth it right now? Um, so that's, it's a constant, it's a constant balance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the next piece is about consistency. Yeah. So I, we know that, you know, through research and our own experiences is that when kids feel anxious and they feel unsafe, one of the first things that you can do to help them um, get back to equilibrium is to be consistent. So building a structure that feels normal, feels um, the same, all of that um, consistency is really calming to kids. So thinking about how we can take the consistency that we provided in our classrooms and translate that to a digital platform. So we're going to talk about two sort of big ideas about how to provide consistency. Um, the first one is building in systems for feedback. So, you know, seven weeks in, you've already done this. So we're going to talk about you know, really, what should that feedback look like? So the first thing I wanted to say is um, students need feedback in order to stay motivated. Um, there was sort of this honeymoon period where this was all new and it was kind of um, weirdly exciting, especially for kids who, you know, in Texas, we don't get a lot of snow days. And so it's like, 
you know, this is a kind of um, a different way to do school. Um, but at this point, it could be getting old for lots of kids. So we have to think about how do we maintain that motivation. And so having meaningful feedback is super important. Um, the first thing I, I'm going to say about that is I think it's important to keep your feedback loop very, very tight um, so that you're not giving out an assignment and then, um, you know, not looking, not giving feedback until, you know, two weeks later. Um, especially for elementary kids, they need that quick feedback in order to really uh, absorb the feedback and do something with it. Um, the second thing about feedback is it, it needs to be bi-directional. So it shouldn't be just you giving feedback to the children, but the children having um, opportunities to um, share feedback with you and maybe even among each other. So thinking about the bi-directionality or the multi-directionality of your um, feedback systems. And then the last thing really is um, park on the positive. Um, this is a time during which um, really critical feedback might not be as helpful as it would be if you were in person. So um, there's so much about, there's so much nuanced about communicating virtually that is more difficult than face-to-face. -face. So, you know, it, it actually takes more energy to um, get meaning from somebody who's digital than if you're face-to-face -face. because you have all of these things about body language and tone and proximity that now you, you can't access or tools you don't have. And so you want to make sure to really praise the effort that's going into assignments and, um, and giving praise in a way that ends up feeling empowering and, po and, and uh, positive. Mm -hmm. So Daniel, let me park right there a sec. Oh, yeah, that there's so much wisdom there that we're, we're implementing and, and trying. Um, I think we are asking so many questions. Um, our teachers are constantly asking children and families. Um, we're trying to gain a sense of what is working what isn't working, what makes them feel successful, um, what might be too much. Um, that it's, imagine you're, you're, you're you know, teaching a lesson and five minutes in, 10 minutes in, you see the confusion, you see the disengagement. It's like, how do you get that feedback at a distance? Um, so teachers are really having to ask lots of questions. Um, Rhonda's point about getting feedback back to kids, they have to know that you're looking at their work. Um, Platforms like Google Classroom make it really quick to respond with comments. Um, and if you're a student and you're submitting three, four, five, six pieces of work and you don't hear from your teacher, you're not going to do that seventh piece of work because what's the point? Nobody seems to be seeing it. Um, something else that we're sort of looking at and, and Rhonda brought up, like there's a level of like consistency and we're getting used to things. And now is a slight opportunity for nuance to, to keep kids engaged as this starts to get older and older. Um, and our teachers are starting to explore how to have student to student interaction. There's so much of that in a class. A kid says something and a student responds and there's that feedback there. And now they're finding ways, okay, I can take this piece of work from a student, share it with three other students and say, what do you notice? What would you tell them as something to focus on next? So we're still bringing in that student voice in that conversation. It's hard <laughs> and it takes an extra step, um, but they're finding that students are enjoying seeing each other's work um, because now they don't feel like they're doing it all alone. Yeah, so I think this is a, another way for you to um, think about the way you're planning your instruction. So not just planning for objectives and tasks and assessment, but also planning for how does feedback happen? Where are, where are my opportunities for feedback and how can I make that varied? So making that part of an educator's planning uh, routine. Um, the other th um, the thing that we wanted to talk about in terms of consistency is yes, be consistent, but also modify that with flexibility. So um, this is not a time, obviously, for rigidity. Uh, we have to really understand and recognize and appreciate that a lot of our kids, um, well, all of our kids have different, um, you know, a, a different variety of support systems. They all have different contexts in which they live and grow. And so we have to think about, you know, do they have the supplies that they need? Um, is this task something that they can do um, by themselves or with very little supervision? If they need some support, is this support that a parent is likely to be able to provide? 
And um, if not, how am I helping them to provide that? Um, be thinking about um, due dates. Uh, you know, does one specific due date make sense? Or for a particular assignment, could you make maybe a narrow range of dates for a due date? So there's all kinds of th things to think about when you're talking about how can I be flexible in a way that doesn't weaken the instruction, but it accommodates for this unprecedented time that we're encountering. I think these are the two words I've said the most in the last seven weeks, um, and it's consistency from adults and flexibility for families. That has been our repeated phrase. Um, our teachers have figured out their schedule, and they have been really consistent with families. They have a morning meeting at 9, they post the work plan at 9, 10, their office hours are at 11, closing circle is at 2.50, and that doesn't change, right? Mm -hmm. Now the work day-to-day -day changes, but that schedule and that opportunity to check in with teachers has been very consistent. We've also said, here are the platforms we're going to use for learning. So Google Classroom, we like to use Flipgrid, which is a video sharing service, 30 seconds, you can upload it and kids can see and watch each other. And Remind, which is a text messaging service that you can use to communicate with families. What we haven't done is tried something new every day that mm -hmm. would only make things more complicated for kids and families. We want them to figure out these pieces. Um, and then a thing about the flexibility piece, um, and it's about what happens when you have one of those students who you might not be connecting with as much. Um, I think about one second grader that we have who he's, he's got an uphill battle with all of this, um, and it is difficult for him to engage consistently. When he does, we make sure to tell him two things. One, we are so glad to see him, and we celebrate just having an opportunity to connect with him. And the second thing is we make sure that he is focusing on that day. And, in, and not just that day, what is most important that day. Mm -hmm. um, if you're seven years old and you sign in and you see 30 assignments that you're late with, that is just so overwhelming. It's just a mountain that just feels like why you even bother. And so what we say is let's focus on these two things. And we're going to be really good at these two things. Um, and we found that when we do that with students, they're successful and they go back and do the work that they've missed because they like that that adrenaline that feedback that feeling successful um, that you get when you get that praise um, so focus on the present and it will it will help clear up some of the things that you wanted all along yeah there was there was one um thing about flexibility that i think teachers can think about and that is um you know how, how can you give kids um flexibility in determining how they're representing their learning. So how they're representing mastery can look different from one kid to another. And I think this is also where student voice can come in. Um, so maybe you have a, I don't know, a spelling assignment. So, you know, kids could make a poem of the words or they could illustrate the word. There's all kinds of different ways to um, have them represent their learning. So it doesn't have to be lockstep. So that's something you might think about. And the results are really interesting too. Kids are getting creative. Yep. True. Yeah. So our last point is about opportunities and challenges. Yeah. So I think this is so important because we can always, um, you know, look at what's hard about this crisis and there are legitimately hard things about this. We know that this is a struggle for everyone, including, um, you know, families and, and it's hitting certain populations disproportionately. So we know that there is an, an equity lens that we need to take in looking at what are the challenges here and trying to, um, as educators, meet those the needs that are out there. Um, we also can look for opportunities in this challenge. And so there are a couple of opportunities that I think are really pertinent for educators to, to look for. Um, and so the first one is, um, and we've talked about this, connecting with families. This is a huge opportunity to connect with families in a way that we have never had before, um, both in terms of depth and frequency. Um, this is really an opportunity to show parents, um, just communicate with them on a human level and to you know, really demonstrate to them how much you really love their kids and how much you really know about their kids. So this is an opportunity that we haven't had before. Um, Dan, you want to weigh in? Yeah, we think about how much our families are growing in terms of what they understand about their children and how they engage in school. Um, and we found that those have been really powerful conversations. We've had families say to us, every time they sit down to do math, 
they get really frustrated, they get agitated, they get walk away from the table, they have a tough time focusing. And the teachers go, yep, I've seen that before too, right? And so there's that connection now where this empathy, this mutual experience, um, and that's an opportunity for us to lean in and say, so what do you do in those moments, right? How do you handle that? Um, and, and we're finding that families are really growing in their understanding of how to work um, with some of those behaviors with students. Um, Another thing that we've encouraged families, there's a number of things that we have in our classrooms that transfer really well to the home. Um, so one of those is our calm down area. If you've ever visited one of our classrooms, there's a quiet space and perhaps there's toys or a fidget tool or a, um, a reflection um, for kids to, to think about how they're processing. Families can set that up at home. There could be a chair or there could be a corner in the living room or there's a quiet space in the yard, perhaps the kids go if, they're, if they need a minute. Um, and families have, have found that when they set that up, see the student get frustrated, see their kid get frustrated and then say, hey, do you wanna take a minute? They're finding the kids are starting to use that tool just like they would in the classroom. Um, so those are some, I mean, just one example of how families are, are transferring some of these really great practices into their home. Yeah, and I also think about, um, you know, schooling at home is something that the large majority of parents have never thought about. It's, it's not something they necessarily wanted to do, definitely haven't been prepared to do it. And I think one of the things, we talked about reassuring kids in the very beginning of this webinar, but I think parents need um, reassurance that what they're doing is really enough. Um, that they're not expected to replicate the school day in their living rooms. Um, and so, that's what I'm talking about, connecting on a real human level. Um, you can support parents in a way that you never thought you could before, and that is, let me share what I know to do and feel good about what you're doing. We joke that our first parent conference, when this is all over, is going to be the other way around. The parents are going to come in, they're going to share with us as teachers, and we're going to take lots of notes. <laughs> so, yeah. Yep. Exactly. And then the, the last um, opportunity that we see, not the last, but the last one we want to talk about this morning is really, you know, this is giving you some opportunities to provide uh, within family connection. So research shows us that a homeschool connection is super important to academic success. But what's even more important is how the family members communicate within the family. And so that's a much harder um, nut to crack and because you all usually don't have access to what's going on with the family. This is an opportunity to provide um, activities and you know, assignments, suggestions uh, for families to do together. So be thinking about what kinds of assignments that you're offering and do they provide the, these um, opportunities for kids to connect with their siblings, with their extended family, with their um, parents and caregivers. Um, all of these opportunities are so important because they help the, the child see himself in a new light within the family context. So I am a learner within this family and my mom's a learner and my brother's a learner. And so thinking about how you can provide those within family connections is super important. But some of my favorite photos and experiences are the collaborations amongst our families. A lot of them have siblings in, in their homes and they're, they're working on projects together. Um, mm -hmm. They might be sharing math projects. Um, cooking and math has become a thing. Uh, I think about our PE teacher. He's organizing daily workout um, videos and he collects videos back of families exercising together. Um, there's one family who are running laps around their house and mom mm -hmm. is cheering them on. Um, that just there's opportunities to bring joy in this um, that we're finding have been really meaningful um, and are, you know, are making people smile. It's giving people a chance to do something in their day that makes them feel accomplished, makes them feel successful um, and brings them closer together. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And it doesn't have to be difficult. I mean, I, I saw a, a video where a family was planting a celery stalk um, like replanting it and so the, the mom had pulled it out to show the kids the root system and I mean everybody from uh, look like a toddler in diapers to um, a teenager were looking at the root systems they all poured water in you know so it doesn't have to be anything really complicated just a way for everybody to participate so we're really building memories right now and love that we can be part of that as educators so so those were our big ideas for today um, yep. looking building 
connection, building consistency, and finding opportunities and challenges. Um, hopefully some of that resonated with you, um, makes you think about your own practice. Perhaps it's validating. Perhaps you're looking at it going, yep, yep, I'm doing all of those things. Perhaps you look at it and say, maybe I want to add something to what I'm doing. Um, and know that everybody, again, has, has different contexts and different experiences. Um, Ron, did you want to add anything? Yeah. No, no, no. I'm, I'm looking over the questions. So yeah. um, it's funny because uh, we, we only have five questions, which is fine. Um, but three of them are really the same question. And it is, um, is there a way to get a copy of the presentation so you can watch it again later? Uh, we'll be, um, be giving the presentation in the email. Um, the answer is yes. We, th we think we will be doing that. Um, I just don't have a date for that. So my um, suggestion is to continue to look on the Momentous Institute website and um, look under training events and you'll find webinars. And I'm sure that as we progress in this um, endeavor, they will have the titles of this webinar and others with the link below. So you can either join live or, or watch, the, um, watch the recorded version. And we're finding a way to combine the best of all three that we've hosted to capture as much as we can before sharing that out. Yep, yep, yep. Um, we do have a question from uh, Dimit uh, Dimitra, and she's asking, I work with Head Start, which is of course low income uh, families. We've attempted several Zoom meetings and we find that many parents have electronic issues, uh, absolutely. Whether it's getting into the Zoom app or utilizing the device. We also notice that many attempt to use their phone as a device which has limited reliable connections, so they tend not to participate. Mm -hmm. uh, Daniel, you want to take a, a stab at this first? We've had similar issues come up, and, and we have a lot of technology in our, at, at our fingertips. Um, I, I, I would encourage you to gauge from your families what they're comfortable using and what is something they feel successful with. Um, and if you try something two or three times and it doesn't work, now is your opportunity to try something else. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's a discussion board where people can post questions and respond and it's sort of a text paragraph kind of format over the course of two or three days. Um, maybe you're having smaller groups, two or three people might have a better connection than seven, eight, 10, 15, 30 people. Um, again, it's the idea of trying and if it doesn't work, Name it, that didn't work, we're gonna try something else. When you exude that optimism and that commitment to trying something else, they'll pick up on that and they'll appreciate that. Involve their voice and keep trying. Yeah, my, my two suggestions, one of them was what you said, Daniel, and that was divide and conquer a little bit. So rather than having big Zoom meetings, have something smaller. The other thing is um, I would look to see how I could support parents in, um, in helping them to use, to understand how to use these formats. So now that things are opening up just a little bit in most states, I think it would be, um, might be a good idea to have IT people who are scheduled to, you know, be at campus at certain times. And of course, using the correct protective um, where um, maybe having a time where they could meet with parents to show them how to use these and maybe, you know, install something if they need something installed on their computers. So I think that personal touch is still going to be necessary as we continue to work digitally. So thinking about how can I tap into the people who provide IT support for my school to now provide that for parents to a, to a certain extent. Um, if you aren't using Remind, I recommend it. Mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a free text messaging service and you can set up groups and you can share files you can communicate so in some ways that might work well for your family yeah I also think you've got to figure out how do I back up my uh, virtual communication with um, old-fashioned communication so you might want to always have that sort of follow-up whether by and by old-fashioned doesn't have to necessarily be um, you know a stamp in an envelope it could be it could literally be a text which you know everybody is comfortable using at this point so and remind is a good one um, here's one that says um, let's see uh, Cindy's asking how are you engaging those families that don't have access to a device or Wi-Fi yeah um, that's been a big one um, we we are fortunate to have a lot of resources. Um, I've become a moving IT truck for families. I drive around 
Dallas and I throw um, hot spots and Chromebooks in the kids' front yards and say, here you go. Um, and I know that that's not the reality for a lot of schools. Um, we are finding ways to go old school, right? So it's that text messaging, it's that phone call, it's the digital or paper newsletters. Um, we've been using those, especially for our youngest grade levels. They don't have computers. They don't have um, those services. And so the teachers make a one pager of the experiences and they send it out as a text message and then they call families and that's where they spend most of their time. Um, and again, there's some people who are going to be responsive every time. And there are some people who you aren't going to get in touch with. Um, and it's important to document that. It's important to, to document how your efforts have gone and to start to notice some trends. Oh, mm -hmm. maybe I'm calling at 10 o'clock every Tuesday and I'm not getting a response. So maybe I have to try something else because they're working. Um, so vary up, you know, the ways in which you're communicating and you might find different results. Mm -hmm. uh, Meg is asking, um, she, she also works with Head Start. She said some families have one child, um, they have time, et cetera. Others have several children and few, de few devices. How do you attain the same level of communication and engagement with such different families' needs and devices? First of all, whoever, I mean, I, I am just in awe of the families <laughs> who are doing all of these things at once, right? They are, they're parenting, they're teaching, they're working, they're being a family member, spouse, whatever that may be. That's hard. Um, I think two things that I would um, sort of park on, and, and I will say, I do not have kids. Um, I, this is not nearly as challenging for me as it is for other people um, who have so many other draws on their attention. Two things. One, it, it, they, 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 they ask the word, how do you keep the same level of communication? You can't. You don't. It's not going to be the same. Please don't compare yourself to your coworkers or, or peers who are single or don't have any kids or have different flexibility. It's not the same for everybody. Um, and the, the second thing I would say is to remember what Rhonda said is like, what you're doing is enough um, to remind yourself um, that we, what you're doing as you're managing all of this, at the end of the day, you've put your best effort in and you have to be okay with that um, mm -hmm. and not beat yourself up for the missed communication, the missed email, the missed chance to connect. Um, and, and the third thing I'd say is to, is to set boundaries, right? You have to say when you're done that day. You have to say when you are and are not available. Um, and hopefully the person that you work with is flexible enough to give you that space, um, recognizing that kids need your attention right now. Um, and it's hard to say I'm going to be on a Zoom for three hours if you've got a four-year-old. That's not a reasonable expectation. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard. It's really hard. Yeah. I mean, I almost think of it like... Um, differentiated support. You know, um, we, we, we're comfortable with providing differentiated instruction as educators. Now we kind of have to flip it a little bit and how do we provide differentiated ex, um, support? Because not everybody needs, <clears throat> pardon, the same level of support. And if you're tracking the way Daniel's talking about um, with how you're communicating and how successful it is, you'll end up with pretty good gauge on these um, group of families need this level of support. This group of families may need a deeper level of support. And that might help you to manage a little bit more how you're providing that. But again, I think Daniel's completely right. You have to unhook from the, the notion that you have to do, everything has to be exactly equal across the board. Um, it's not that way in a classroom, right? Um, because while you're providing great instruction, you're providing different levels of support to all kids. Um, here's one that I don't think, um, I don't think we've had this problem at, at Momentous, I'm hopeful, but it could be. It says, um, how do you handle parents who say, sorry, online learning isn't for us, we're not doing it? We, we have a phrase at Momentous that we use all the time, which is about chasing the why. When we see a student behavior, we often try and figure out what's the underlying need or ask that they're trying to get that they might not be getting. We use the same thing with families. So the first thing that I would encourage you to do, and again, it depends on the relationship you have with the family, is to chase that why a little bit. What part of distance learning is making you feel like you can't do it? Um, and, and try and dig a little bit deeper. Perhaps there's concerns about sharing what their situation is at home in a more public way. Perhaps it's the idea that they don't have access to resources like technology or internet and they don't want to admit that, right? We're asking parents to be vulnerable here and they may or may not want us to know, 
Um, and so it's part of it's like, it is respecting that, right? You, they, if they say they're not doing it, ask a little bit and see what their response is. And if they come back with more, it, it's one of those things to kind of step back a second. If you're a teacher, I would encourage you to talk to your administrator about that as well. That um, is something that they should know about. Um, and at the end of the day, if you try and connect and a family isn't engaging, you've done, you know, you've done your job. You've done what you can. Um, and some of that's outside of your control. Mm -hmm. I also think we should bring in here, Daniel, that um, for those of you who work for districts, you should be tapping into your, um, your student support, your family support um, directors, who should be able to help with some of the, um, the needs that families are going through right now. And so, you know, don't try to handle everything on your own. Reach out to the people in your district who are really tasked with um, providing these levels of support. But I, I agree completely with what you just said, Daniel. And if that um, kid is keeping you up at night because you're worried that they're not ready for the next grade level, they're going to come back to school eventually. And teachers are amazing at figuring out at the beginning of the year what students need. And so if this, you know, two months isn't their best two months of learning, that's okay. And when yeah. we get them back, we're going to make sure we make it count. So Yeah, yeah. Um, Christy, so she's asking, um, how do you, um, how have you been able to engage um, or help some of the parents that are feeling overwhelmed from suddenly being the child's teacher? Great question. Yeah. Um, we've tried to be really clear with families of what, what is their level of expectation? Like, what are we expecting them to do during the day? We aren't expecting them to teach lesson. We aren't expecting them to do the work of the teacher in a lot of ways. Um, and so we've been clear with families, how do you access teachers when you feel overwhelmed, when you need support, when you need additional help? Um, and that's been a really great case by case basis. Um, I think about our families that have two or three kids at home and really like the younger student perhaps might need support, but they're focusing so much on the younger ones. Um, and so that's really as a teacher, get connected, figure out what is the overwhelm, like where is the overwhelmedness coming from um, and make a plan. You know, when they start to get frustrated after five, 10 minutes, stop. <laughs> mm -hmm. call it quits, connect with the teacher or say that's it for the day um, mm -hmm. are, are some ways that I would try and handle that. Yeah, um, you know, Daniel, you have a, a saying that I love and it's small wins, small wins. And I think that's really applicable here. So um, encouraging um, parents to look for a small win and just be happy with it. Instead of we have to finish this whole assignment and you know the tears and, and the drama and all that kind of stuff, that, that is not helpful at this time. So encouraging them to look for small wins and then you um, recognizing and affirming that they've, they're have they having small wins, I think is huge. Um, here's some- Another, Can I add one more thing? Too? Oh, please. Another metaphor that we use with families is the, the oxygen mask on an airplane. You have to put yours on first before you tend to the person next to you parents, their emotional consistency, positivity, or frustration seeps out and affects children. Um, and so it's one of those things where if parents recognize those moments and then figure out how to calm themselves, that will translate to students. Um, when adults get frustrated, kids feel it. So yeah. that's an important yeah. message to pass along. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I, I'm gonna I, gonna murder this name, and it's, I can see that it's a beautiful name written out. Uh, I think it's Iva Lissy, um, and I'm sorry if I've if I've really butchered your name. Um, she's asking. Uh, we have reached out. Oh, she's actually telling us. I think this is a great comment. Um, we've reached out to families first to thank them for their efforts. Um, perfect, and assist them individually. Uh, we also created a video for families with the stages on how to connect with us. Yeah. Great idea. Yeah. Um, and, and to add something to that too, we've actually hosted parent learning days. We've invited parents to come and join the learning so they can see what it looks like to access a lesson, to watch a video, to submit an assignment on Flipgrid or Google Classroom. They've lived a day as a student, uh, which the students really enjoyed, right? They loved watching their parent do the work too. Uh, but that really helped clear up some of the things parents were wondering about of like, how does my kid actually do this every day? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So that's been helpful. Like a, like a little back to school night kind of thing. Uh, here's Melissa. Any suggestions for what morning meeting might look like at a secondary level? Yeah. Hmm. Ooh. Um, I will caution if morning meetings are not something that you've done before, to be a little bit tricky to convince older students to want to do it. 
Um, the idea of introducing mindfulness practices, especially seventh, eighth graders, can be challenging. Um, that's what I taught when I first started this, and they rebelled or fought against it as much as they could. So if you try something and it doesn't work, keep trying. That That's a natural experience in this. You're asking kids to be vulnerable in morning meetings. I would start with something small, perhaps a question to engage them, and it could be fun, right? Would you rather have a third arm or a tail? Would you rather live underwater or in space? Get them thinking, get them talking, um, and then move into perhaps a recap of something that happened yesterday. So use it as like a mini reteaching moment. Hey, yesterday on problem four, we struggled with this concept, way you could solve it the next time. And part of what you're doing there is showing kids, it's worth me checking into this meeting. Make it valuable for them, make it meaningful. Um, I would set the schedule for the day. That's been really helpful for kids to know what's coming. Even older kids, they like to know. Um, so those are some ways that you can build in your morning meetings, opportunities to share. Um, you can do show and tell, you could assign jobs, you could have a current events coordinator where one kid has to find a story they wanna share with the class. You could have a comedian where they get to share a joke every day. Um, give kids a reason to be there um, is what I would recommend. Yeah, I think that last suggestion is, is what I would park on. I think once you get to secondary students, they've got to run the show. Mm -hmm. um, and it's important to give them something to do so that's more their idea because your ideas are just not going to be smart, you know, because they're teenagers and they're smart. So um, I would, yeah, I would, I would say um, during morning meetings, we need a question every day. So um, who will ask the question on Tuesday and let them come up with a question. So I think their buy-in will be greater when their voices are heard. Um, let's see. Uh, Kathy's asking, for those of us who don't have permission to record kids, what is a solution? I, I'm going to say that is probably beyond what I feel comfortable answering. If you have district policies that you have to, to stick with, I would stick with whatever they have shared. Mm -hmm. um, if you've got concerns, if you want to be filming lessons for the purpose of sharing it, right, the asynchronous model so kids can come and see videos if they aren't able to access it, that's a reasonable reason to want to record a lesson, I would talk to your administrators, ask them from a district level, what can we do instead? Right. And I think she's talking about recording kids, not recording self. And so I think like, if, I'm sorry. I was thinking like a Zoom, like if I'm teaching a Zoom lesson and there's mm -hmm. 10 kids, can I record that? Yeah, but I, um, I mean, from my perspective, you don't have to record a Zoom, so that can be just real time. So, you're, so there is no recording, so you wouldn't be violating anything. The other thing is, you know, we were talking about giving kids um, access to each other's work in order to provide feedback. So, not recording the kids, but maybe recording their product um, might be a good good way to handle that. Um, Amitria. Um, Let's see, what advice do you have for families, parents who may be overwhelmed? I find that my anxiety is transferring to my children. Um, you know, Daniel talked about this um, already. I think what I would add to this is, this is an opportunity to teach parents um, social emotional learning and social emotional health skills. So you're talking about transferring your anxiety. Lots of parents don't maybe have access to that information. So talking to parents about, you know, mirror neurons and the way that you're feeling is going to be spread you know, throughout the house. And so um, talking about how you calm yourself as a teacher, what works for you, giving them some breathing practices. Daniel, anything that you can add to that? Yeah, I think it's about finding ways for yourself to recharge, whether that's going for a walk or reading a book or staring at the wall for five minutes. Um, those are ways that all of us as adults are trying to figure out how do we cope um, with this new normal. And I put the word normal in quotes because none of it yeah. feels normal. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then and a follow-up by um, Amitri is I do my best. Oh, she's just giving us a, um, some advice here. I do my best to use our mindfulness learning, especially having multiple grade level kids at home uh, while working and maintaining the home. Yeah, mindfulness is huge here. Uh, Allison, uh, do you have any plans to yet to make the last week of school special? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we think a lot about um, and I, we talk all about this a little bit tomorrow, um, there is a sense of loss in this. There's a sense of mourning different experiences. And maybe it's the kindergarten teacher who had a student that's just about ready to read, and then they left. 
and you might not get that moment. Or our fifth graders, they're going to graduate. They've been with us at Momentus for eight years and they're going to leave. Um, and they are not going to have that rite of passage in a way that they were expecting. Mm -hmm. um, I think the first step is to acknowledge that there is a sense of loss, right? Name it. It's okay to feel sad. It's okay to feel disappointed that you aren't getting these things. Um, we are in the process of planning a graduation. We don't have a perfect plan yet. Um, we've kicked around the idea of a drive around parade. Um, sorry, my dog is snoring. So <laughs> you might have heard her in the background. Um, so um, we've talked about a graduation parade, driving to every family. Um, we have an idea of having like a celebration at our school. We have this front driveway that we would have everybody drive through and we'd have balloons and we would hand them their diploma um, and, and a, a little something um, in that way. It's really thinking about um, involving teachers in that conversation. They know them best. They're connected with the students and say, well, how do you want to celebrate these, these, these children um, and have them be part of that planning process. And you'll get, you'll find something creative. Think outside of the box. You don't have to do something just because you've always done it. Mm -hmm. um, so this kind of breaks the mold for us. Yeah, I was talking to a, a teacher who teaches senior English, and she's having um, she's having each child de uh, de develop their own Padlet, and then the last week of school, the, all of the um, Padlets will be open so that other kids can sign their Padlet like they would have signed a yearbook. So um, with you know good wishes and whatever. So lots of things that people are thinking about. Um, Rhonda, I'm looking at time. Yeah. Um, we're getting close. Here's what we can do. Let's, mm -hmm. let's go ahead and close. Um, and then we're happy to stick around for a couple more minutes and answer more questions if people want to stay. Um, just want to be aware of people's time and, and whatnot. Yeah. Um, I guess, so our closing thought um, is, is twofold. Um, one, uh, more than twofold. Why don't I put a number to it? There's so many things. One, thank you for joining us today. Um, the work you are doing is so important. Um, teachers are, are, in our opinion, frontline workers. They're just behind the scenes. Um, you are working with your students and families in such important ways every day. So thank you for what you're doing. Um, second thing is you're not doing this alone. We're all trying to figure this out together. If you check out momentousinstitute.org slash blog, you will see a whole bunch of resources with strategies from breathing to mindfulness experiences to ways to support families. So check that out. Um, great resources there if you'd like to, to check those out. Rhonda, do you wanna say anything in closing? Nope, uh, just thank you so much. Stay safe and um, stay connected. Yeah, thank you for what you're doing. So a bunch of people will sign off. You're very welcome, everybody that's saying thanks. It's a pleasure to have you all join. Oh, a kindergarten Zoom would be so much fun. I know, I just saw that. Yeah. So shall we answer the rest of these questions yeah. real quick? Let's do it. Um, Let's this is a them. Yeah, this is a question um, from somebody who doesn't leave their name, but um, what are you doing to support your teachers um, who also have families that they need to help with schoolwork, fix meals, et cetera. Teachers have run into feeling like they have to focus on their school families um, and are ignoring their own families. Yeah. This is real. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've checked in um, with each of our, fam our teachers who have their own family. Um, and for, for me, my message to them was your family comes first. Um, you have to make sure that you are caring for the children that are under your roof. Um, and that's much easier said than done because a lot of teachers say, my kids are going to be fine, right? We, we do this because we work with the kids that are in our classroom. But I set that up for them from the very beginning. Think about your schedule. Think about what your kids need and build your teaching schedule around their needs. We have a teacher that has a newborn and I've told her, if you need to not be doing things because that child needs your attention, please like take care of them first. Um, and it's, it's that check-in, right? It's that constant asking teachers, how are you? And then waiting and, and really getting to the sense of perhaps they're worried that other people will, you know, think differently of them. Maybe they're worried that their coworkers or think they're not pulling their, their weight. Um, perhaps they're worried that their students are going to come back to school behind. Spoiler, they are, and it's okay. <laughs> We're gonna work on it. Um, it's again, just connecting on that personal level and figuring out for them, like what is it that's that 
motivator for them to perhaps care more about their students in their classroom um, and give them that space to say it's okay you can't do everything every day yeah. it's the old oxygen mask right and, and families are forever so um, this is a small point in time but you've got to take care of your families um, Laura's asking what activities are the kids doing during zoom recess is it free play or are teachers planning the play no it's it's free play it is, um, gosh, if I had to tell teachers to plan one more thing, they would, I don't know, say terrible things about me on mute. <laughs> no, it's, it's the idea that it's really free. It's, they set some ground rules, right? There are some behaviors that we know we don't want, right? So sort of make that as a group. What are going to be our norms for our Zoom recess? And then let them go. Um, and, and clean up anything that you need to. They're having fun with it. The kids really look forward to it. Yeah. Um, Cindy, one issue we're experiencing, this is huge when I read this, but one issue we're experiencing is teachers sending uh, shout outs to students who are completing all assignments. This is turning off some families from uh, now even checking messages from the teacher because they aren't meeting expectations. Quote, um, how are your teachers providing praise without calling out those students who aren't doing the assignments? Rhonda, do you want to take this one first? I feel yeah. like this is right up your alley of like, how do we praise in right. a, a meaningful way? So, Yes, yeah, sure. So what I uh, what I, I know by research, I know by personal experience is that it doesn't matter if you're in the classroom or you you are doing this virtually. Um, praise needs to be private. If you want praise to be really effective, it needs to be private. So those systems of feedback we talked about, you should have a system for feedback that involves praise. All of your feedback should have some level of sincere, genuine, um, contingent praise. So whether it's, you know, you had a whole sheet and the kid just uh, did one well i can praise you for the effort you put into this one but i would not do these call outs um, publicly i don't think they're helpful um even teaching university students i learned that you couldn't put praise out publicly on a, a blackboard format which is a digital format because it made the other groups feel bad if they didn't get the same feedback it was amazing to me so private feedback is where i'd go i i agree um, I, it's to me there is something to celebrate about how every kid is doing this right now and it's not only certain kiddos who are doing all of it right there is something to celebrate for each of them I, and I personally I go back to the like if you're doing all of it are you doing it a high quality mm -hmm. right and are you creating a culture of completion for completion's sake as opposed to did you do the work well um, so I would have a private conversation with that teacher, right? That's something you want, maybe not address publicly um, mm -hmm. with your whole staff. We are not gonna do this anymore. That's not the way I'd go about it. I would talk to them personally. Hey, I've noticed you've been sending these messages. Tell me more about what you were thinking. What are you hoping to accomplish when you send those messages? Hmm, how could we go about getting that same effect in a way that's supporting families who are not doing all of the work um, and, and go from there? Yeah, because this comes from a good place. I mean, this comes from a good place in the heart that teacher's trying to praise, but um, just figuring out how she can do it so that's not having this type of effect. Uh, Amitria, summer camp. Are you planning to have one? What are steps you take, you're take? you taking to prepare if you can? Um, no. we. And that question has come up from so many families. They're like, are we still going to get activities when school's out? And we have had to say no. Um, we're planning a summer camp for our teachers. We have a, a, a couple of weeks of professional learning. We typically teach until the end of June. So our contract is 11 months. So we're currently planning professional learning for the month of June. We're gonna end the end of May for students. Um, so no summer camp for kids, but a summer camp of learning for adults, <laughs> so. Yep, yep, yep. Um, one question that wasn't asked, and I just wanted to get in here really quickly because it was asked the last time and I thought it was a good question and it was, what are you doing for social emotional learning lessons like are there any sites out there that provide activities and i noticed that this this week i was looking around in the castle site um, c-a-s-e-l dot org they have a tab that is sel at home that provides links to all kinds of activities that you could um, assign so kids can do them at home so castle is a great one susan yep. kaiser greenland's website as well um, has a whole covid page of resources mm -hmm. to do at home songs books games um check it out yeah susan kaiser greenland's website yeah, yeah. edutopia is another good one yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's the link so um c-a-s-e-l dot org is the one i mentioned 
the one that Daniel mentioned was um, somebody's name, Susan, Susan Kaiser Greenland. Um, Kaiser is whole name. I think it's Inner Kids, isn't it? Inner Kids? I think it's just SusanKaiserGreenland.com. Okay. She also does have a site called Inner Kids, I know, that you might look at. Um, and then I, I mentioned Edutopia is another one that you might want to check out, and that's E D U T O P I A. I think that's right. <laughs> so lots of stuff out there that you might want to look at. And, and Kathy, thank you for the nice words. Yes, all of you really appreciate it. Um, so with that, we're done. The end of our questions. Yeah. Thank you all so right. much. Thanks, thanks everyone.